Hello guys, how are you? I'm Hadeep Singh. Welcome back to your own YouTube channel. IELTS updates and recent exams. For more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing test topics, listening, reading, practice test, and speaking, you can just work. Please guys, participate in everyday listening and reading practice test to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page IELTS updates and recent exams. Part 1 You will hear two flatmates, Tom and Richard, discussing the rules of their shared house. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Richard, as we discussed before with this extra bedroom in the house, we should advertise for another tenant, but I think we've got to establish rules this time. We already have two rules about the rent money. Remember, we pay on the 5th and expect full payment with no excuses. Sure, but I mean additional rules apart from those two. OK, there's certainly no harm in that. Remember the problems we've had with people in the past. I think we should learn from those bad experiences. Y you may have a point there. For example, you know that I like cooking, so I can propose a kitchen rule straight away. Every tenant must clean after use. We shouldn't allow what happened last time. You mean that guy who left all his dirty dishes piling up and food on the floor? Clean after use. We should write that down. I'm happy with that. And not only clean, but they also have to tidy up. We can't have them cluttering up our very small kitchen counter. I'm with you there. That will make life far more manageable. So tidy up is our second cooking rule, let's say. And now, can I tell you what really annoys me? Sure. Dirty tenants. Those who just allow dirt and dust to build up around the house and don't care less. We've got to have a strict rule prohibiting that. What about a cleaning roster? We can make a list of everything that we expect to be done. Carpets vacuumed, furniture dusted, toilet cleaned, and so on. And everyone is required to take turns. First my turn, then your turn, then the third tenant's turn. This spreads the load so we can keep the apartment very clean. I'm happy with that. Otherwise, one person will be working harder than the others. But how often do we do it? Every day, twice a week, or once a week, or what? Every day. What do you think? Too often, I would say. Well, every three days, then. I don't know. We're, we're all busy with part-time jobs and study. I'd say that once a week is good enough. It's probably what most households do, anyway. All right, all right. Let's run with that, then. As long as we do clean regularly and well. OK. Are there any other rules? What about music, loud TV, that sort of thing? I want absolute quiet at night because I go to bed early in order to get up early for my job. So, why don't we say no noise after, say, 11 at night? Earlier than that, 10pm. That's consistent with most rental properties and no overnight visitors either. You're right. That caused a lot of problems when the last tenant brought his drinking buddies in for the night. So, we prohibit late-night noise and overnight visitors as well. That sounds good to me. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. OK, Richard, 
If we want to advertise for an extra tenant for the third bedroom, there's a website with an online form here that we can fill out. That will speed things up. Good idea. In fact, let's do it now and get it over and done with. Sure. The first category here is gender. I guess that means we write male or female. I think I'd prefer a male. He'd fit in with us. One of the boys, something like that. Sure, but that might limit things, and I'd say a female might be just what this household needs. Why don't we say any and let fate decide? See who turns up and judge them as they come. OK, I'll type any. So now we move on to job. What sort of job do you want them to have? To me, it doesn't matter. Doctor, lawyer, cleaner. As long as they have a job, of course. Unemployed tenants can be a problem. Just type in must have. You mean a job? Yes. Must. OK, that's done. Now, how much should we ask them to pay? $180 would be about one third of the total rent. Uh, I'm doing the maths now with a calculator. The figure would be closer to $173.50. Well, let's round that up to the nearest five. I'll type in $175 and we can share the extra $1.50. Done. Now, finally, when can we let the new tenant move in? Immediately, I'd say. The sooner the better. Type in immediately. But I'm busy this week with my job, so I'm not in the mood to interview tenants right now. And anyway, we've had just you and me for so long, what does another couple of weeks matter? So, when would you like the tenant to move in then? One week from now? Beginning of the month, March 1st? Later. Give it another four days at least. March the 5th is better for me. OK, I'll type that in. It should be fine. Any later than March the 8th and I'll be too busy with my exams. And that's about it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear a police officer giving a lecture to some overseas students about ways to minimise risk in public. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Hello everyone. As new students having just arrived, it is important that you are conversant with some of the aspects of living safely here. Let me immediately say that, in contrast to the high crime rate in other cities, ours is very low. Nevertheless, there is some advice that would be considered prudent in even the safest of places. It is therefore in your interest to look at this map of the city and familiarise yourself with its areas, some of which may not be as safe as others, particularly at night. A little research now in this respect will obviously help you a great deal. For this reason, we have provided a variety of brochures and information leaflets which we encourage you to take and read. In addition, you should talk to people you know, to your homestay parents and teachers, and get a feel for the situation both in the neighbourhood where you live and the city at large. Now, you should know about the police presence in this city. There are local police stations in every suburb, but not all of these are open 24 hours a day. For that, you need a main station, of which there are many, and you should familiarise yourself as to the location of the one nearest to you. Moving on, many of you might like to go out at night. So, you should also familiarise yourself with the public transport system. 
It could put you at risk if you are wandering around lost in the late hours of the night, particularly if you are a woman. Our city has a fairly good public transportation system, but not all of it operates necessarily to late hours. For this reason, you can avail yourself of the special late night buses known as night birds, which operate along most major routes. Again, collect one of the brochures on the table here for the night bird timetables. Finally, if you do feel there is an emergency, you can dial triple zero. However, this does not take you through to a police station, but rather an operator. This operator will question you as to the nature of the problem and then send your call through to the relevant department, police, fire or ambulance, as the situation demands. This may take up valuable time, and for this reason, we suggest that you find the emergency number of the nearest main station to where you live. This will speed up the process should you need police services in the event of a serious problem. Having said all this, let me remind you once again that this is a very safe city, and we don't expect any problems to occur. Yet, it always pays to be prepared. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. On the same subject as being prepared for problems, it is a fact that the police cannot cover every part of the city at all times of the day. Thus, it is advisable for you to take some precautions and be prepared for any problems which may occur. There are less safe areas which you may inadvertently find yourself in and, through no fault of your own, be faced with difficulties. In this respect, some people advise that women in particular carry mace or pepper spray, which can be sprayed into the eyes of an assailant. However, please be informed that these are illegal and consequently cannot be purchased, constituting, as they do, an attack weapon. On that same theme, any knives or small arms, while perhaps being legal in your country, are illegal here and must not be carried on your person. One thing you can carry, however, is a personal siren. In the advent of a problem, you just push a button and the siren will sound loudly, drawing such attention that any assailant almost invariably flees immediately from the scene. Moving on, you may wish to stay out late to have fun or see the sights of this city at night, and we do not necessarily discourage that. However, we do advise that you confine yourself to areas that have sufficient street lighting or illumination. In the course of your activities, you may well meet strangers, but if this happens under clearly lit areas, visible to everyone in the vicinity, statistics prove that in almost all cases, nothing will go wrong, particularly if you carry your siren. Above all, the greatest rule is simply to exercise discretion and intelligence when you go about your business. All the rules that I have given are simply based on this, and by following them all, your stay here will be both enjoyable and safe. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear three students, Steve, David and Susan, discussing a science lecture they attended. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
What did you think about the lecture, David? I thought it was rather interesting. I liked the way it examined the personalities as well as the achievements of the three great physicists of history. It was also interesting in the way it highlighted that all of them had traits in common, despite being removed by centuries. What did you think, Stephen? I thought, for their times, all three scientists were quite revolutionary. Also, I found it quite funny how Galileo, the Italian physicist, in his great work,、uh, what was it called? It's usually abbreviated to two systems. Yeah, yeah, in the two systems. It isn't really science in the conventional sense at all because it's so funny. How can science have characters? One of them with the name Simplicio. I think, though, that it stands as significant in that it was the first major work in which authority was challenged. Before that, the church and the state and royalty all held absolute authority over the thinking of the times. But Galileo was brave enough to challenge this by putting forward scientific truth. It simply started everything. I agree with you there, and it was important. And I don't wish to underestimate that at all. But Galileo's works were somewhat scattered. He couldn't fuse all the ideas together. That had to wait for Newton's Principia. So why do we call it that? It's not even English. Well, Newton wrote his Principia in Latin, as was the practice of all scientists of the time. Principia is the key word in the title, which we usually use when referring to this great work. And I think you're right, David. Its significance lies in the way it finally created order. Before that, things were still confused, disordered. Let's say. That's right, Susan. With Newton, the heavens became like a clockwork mechanism, where the orbits and motion of the planets and comets could be predicted. Newton simply created order, and suddenly the universe seemed understandable. Until Einstein came along and confused the hell out of everyone. Yes, I agree that his relativity is mathematically complex, but once you conquer this, it is remarkably straightforward. Why did he call it relativity anyway? Because every motion is relative to the motion of other bodies, hence relativity. I suppose it's a logical name when you think about it. Yes, and the significance of the theory lay in the way it explained gravity. Prior to that, gravitational motion or action at a distance was just assumed to happen, but nobody quite knew why. Einstein was successful in providing a theory which explained this, and that theory has lasted to the present day. That makes it quite an accomplishment. I think we'd have to agree that all three scientists accomplished much in their own way. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. So, David, you're obviously impressed with these three scientists. So, it would be interesting to know who you think was the greatest of all. Well, strictly, it's impossible to say, since everything is relative to the times in which these scientists lived. Newton built upon the works of Galileo, and Einstein built upon the works of Newton. But that's not true, actually. Einstein's theories were non-Newtonian, which is why they were so substantially ahead of their time. Given this, I'd say Einstein is the greatest. Well, certainly, Steve. I accept that Einstein was great and substantially ahead of his time, but Newton's laws are still used today. Galileo, in contrast, didn't form any workable theory that lasted, and Einstein's theories. Are more just theoretical abstractions. Well, not really. We still use them for cosmological theories, black holes. But not for everyday life. Not for normal planetary physics. In that sense, Newton has stood the test of time and must be considered the best of all. What do you think, Susan? Did you know that Newton's first law of motion is often attributed to Galileo? 
and that Galileo is known as the father of modern science, even by Einstein, which supports him being the greatest, I would say that we must acknowledge the man who first started the scientific revolution. Without his work, we wouldn't have Newton or Einstein. Oh, Susan, that's ridiculous. Galileo's works were unscientific and almost farcical. Look, here's Peter. Let's ask him. Peter, which scientist do you think was the greatest? Greatest? Ah, the old argument. Einstein is the conventional answer, but when it comes down to it, no one quite knows what his theories really mean. Newtonian physics is at least understandable, so I'll go for him. Yes, there you go. Well, we'll just have to agree to disagree on that one. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about brands and branding. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. In the Wild West, without fences or defined ownership of land, one man's cattle could easily be mixed up with another. Hence, cattle were branded. That is, a sign was scarred onto their skin using a hot iron brand. Well, we still use the word today, but in a more general sense. Putting it simply, a brand is a name, term, design or symbol which identifies one seller's goods from another. The car model might be called an Echo. But the brand is Toyota, complete with a Toyota symbol. People will trust brands, leading them to buy other products of the same brand. Then it has achieved brand recognition, which is a very good thing to have. Similarly, perhaps your clothes are Gucci, your jeans are Calvin Klein, your medicine is Procter & Gamble, and your cheesecake is the pleasantly termed Sara Lee. And that's the way you like it. Actually, all those previous brand names show you one way to coin the name of your brand. Just name your company and its products after yourself. This is known as using founder's names, which is all right if your name is catchy and cadent such as, well, Calvin Klein, but there are many other ways as well. Well, here are some other ways to decide on your new brand name. You could use an acronym such as IBM or AWA, which sounds modern, scientific and technically proficient. You might also wish to evoke feelings with an evocative name such as Everest Airlines, where the skies are yours, or Amazon Books, with streams of literature, biggest in the world, or Nike, named after the winged Greek god of victory. Alternatively, you might like to describe your product by using a descriptive brand name, Safe and Sleep Bedding, Ever Alert Security System, and so on. Or you could make it rhyme to be more easily remembered, Reese's Pieces, Faster Pasta, and others. Another method is just to invent a word when none existed before, technically known as a neologism. Names such as We, Kodak, or Rolex. And there are more methods as well. Each comes with its own appeal, but ultimately, everyone wants a global brand. Facebook, Pepsi, Nike, a name recognised all around the world. Now, let's go a little deeper into brands. One of the things which companies seek for their brands is an independent identity, or a concept regarding how the buyer feels about or perceives the product. A good example is Marlboro Cigarettes with its cowboy imagery and sponsorship of car racing, all targeting a manly, tough male buyer. 
In other words, the images, commercials, logos, sponsorship and product packaging are all carefully designed to cultivate a single identity which resonates, in theory, with the target market. The core element of this is the logo, the visual symbol that represents the brand. So, if, for example, the product is for younger people, say, Nike jogging shoes, the catch cry is, just do it, and high-profile athletes appear in all their advertisements. Think of that Nike logo, that single tick, one of the most recognizable logos in the world. And it's all consistent with the symbolism of power, speed, and freedom. On the other hand, if you are targeting a richer, more mature, and male buyer, say, with Rolex watches, the brand image might be one of solidity, sophistication, reliability, and the Rolex logo, a crown, that sign of royalty, of might and power, top of the heap, similarly puts forward this image. If we are targeting the younger teenage market, say with Calvin Klein jeans, the brand image is one of sexiness, rebellion and freedom from conventions. The logo is simply the name on the jeans, but it is linked to that famous series of sexy models and those controversial ads, which still run to this day. This is all big science now, collectively known as brand management. It's complicated, but when done well, can result in millions of dollars in extra sales. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking, you got guesswork. Please guys participate in every day new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material then please join my telegram channel. So guys please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.